thank you everybody for coming out tonight for our event. We are going to be talking about how we can grow our greenways faster. So we hope that you leave here inspired and excited to make that happen. I'm Meg Fensel, I'm the Director of Engagement and Impact at Sustaining Charlotte, and we're a 501c3 nonprofit that is helping the Charlotte area grow in a sustainable way. And we really do that by focusing on helping to make more sustainable land use and transportation decisions. And of course, greenways are great places for recreation, but they can also be part of an active transportation effort that gives people real options for how to move around our county and our region without a car. So, we are really excited to be joined by our special guest speaker tonight, as well as an amazing panel. And Dennis Marcano Sorianos from the East Coast Freeway Alliance, and he's going to share a lot of ideas for how we can fund our greenway. So, uh, more from him in just a moment, but first, just a few announcements from Sustain Charlotte. So, we are hosting some greenway walks with AARP this year, and also partnering with Carolina Thread Trail and Partners for Parks. So the first one is going to be on March 3rd, uh, which is a Friday morning, but uh, people of all ages are welcome to come out to those and have a good time. And we'll have a naturalist there to point out some of the wildlife and nature that we hopefully see at that event. We also are trying something a little bit different. We're hosting a sustainability board game night. So I'm looking all for my fellow nerds out there. These are going to be transportation and trail and uh, building development themed board games. So if you're an expert or you just want to learn how to play a board game, come out to Divine Barrel on March 8th and join us for that. We also are hosting uh, a Earth Day uh, Greenway walk and cleanup. We've adopted a segment of the Campbell Creek Greenway in East Charlotte. So join us on Earth Day and we'll provide donuts and you just show up with a, a smile and help us clean up some trash and, and walk on the greenway. Also, the Sustain Charlotte Awards are coming up on April 27th, so a few days after Earth Day. We are also accepting nominations, so if you know of an individual, an organization, a project that should be recognized for its contribution to advancing sustainability, please submit a nomination. And you can find out information about all of these events at sustaincharlotte.org slash events. And also, if you like events like this, uh, our members help us to make these events happen. So we would love for you to learn more about becoming a member of Sustain Charlotte, come to these events for free, and support the, the work that we do, as well as the work that uh, we're doing in partnership with other organizations. So um, Paul Freestone, who is the chair of the Mecklenburg County Park and Greenway Commission, has been very instrumental in helping to move greenways forward faster is going to tell you more about growing our greenways and who the partners in this initiative are. And then he'll be introducing our guest speaker.
regional, state level, but also here, in, especially in Eichelberg County. But there are some critical decisions being made, and we want to be active about getting out in front of advocating to make sure that those decisions support that momentum going forward. Most significantly, our capital improvement plan, uh, a five-year plan for investment uh, at the county level. The county is responsible for building most of our greenways, not all of them. We have towns represented here tonight, but this is a significant opportunity to make a legacy generational investment in our future, and we want to talk about um, how we can get out in front of advocacy for that this evening. The other thing I'd like to do is, I'm going to make enemies of everybody else on the panel, but partly the timing for this panel is that we wanted to seize the opportunity when Dennis Marcato Sariano was coming through the, the region and uh, leveraged his expertise along the whole East Coast Greenway. Dennis, uh, born and bred in North Carolina, he grew up on a, a tributary of the Hall River, uh, and he has significant nonprofit experience. This guy started a nonprofit, a student organization that had a thousand plus members. Well, he was an undergrad at UNC, got his master's in public administration at Princeton, uh, and has been associated with many nonprofits and growing those nonprofits, and most recently the East Coast Freeway, which is headquartered in Durham, so here in the state. So again, we want to celebrate the momentum uh, that we have right now, but also talk about ways that we can sustain that momentum this evening. So I'd like to turn it over to Beth Fugge to facilitate this evening. Thanks for going straight into your presentation. Sounds good. Thank you. Not quite yet. We're working on it. 
let's work together, let's get it done, but it's not quite ready for prime time. It's more for the adventurous, and there are a lot of those adventures. So we're building it out. And here, just got a little basic video about our vision. And just to give you a few sound bites about our vision, it's not just a ribbon of asphalt. This is moose to the manatee. This is pines to palms. This is the best blueberry pie you could ever imagine to the best key lime pie. <laughs> it's about experiencing culture and history and each other and nature and weaving those things together to an experience that you can't do at 70 miles an hour on a road, but you can do when you're biking and you're running and you're walking, you're connecting with those communities. So here's a video. Since the East Coast Greenway Alliance was founded in 1991, our advocacy efforts have led to the continued expansion of the East Coast Greenway through cities, towns, and rural communities along the East Coast. We're working to complete this 3,000-mile continuous protected path stretching from Maine to Florida, from the pine trees to the palm trees. The East Coast Greenway gets people moving for equitable, active transportation and recreation. It connects us to the natural world, encourages sustainable economic development, and provides an accessible community gathering space for all. Working alongside state and local partners, our team is more than two billion dollars in public investment and developed more than 1,000 miles of the route and we're just getting started. So uh, we've got a great comms department. I want to thank Mary Page and McLaurin uh, uh, just south of the border, South Carolina. She's moved to Durham and she does a great work for us. Um, but one thing that we received as an email in response to that video, it's pretty funny. It's like, wait a second, you've been working for 30 years and you're just getting started? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but that's why we're here. We're talking about how can we get it done faster? How can we build these greenways faster? Because people need them and they want them. I just wanted to give you a little look at the year 2022. What were some of the highlights? Again, the first ever runner, Shan Riggs, he ran the whole East Coast Greenway. He did it in a way that is pretty miraculous got a lot of uh, media attention. Right at the end, his, uh, his, his girlfriend was biking the way, so she had the tent and other things with her, and he was running. And then, so, of course, when you get at the end of that, if you still like the person, what do you do? Get on one knee. And so they're now married, happily, and they actually have an East Coast Greenway tattoo on their calves. But um, that's not required. <laughs> but just, it's amazing, and I, and I really recommend to anyone who's developing a greenway and trail, you know, bring up the stories of the amazing people that are experiencing your root, your nature, your community, because that brings it to life. It's, it just can't win. It can't become a priority unless it has stories that connect <laughs> with the people, all the people and especially legislators and town councilmen and county commissioners and uh, others like that. It's really key. So last year was really great. Actually, in the past two years, we've had $750 million in public investment move. And, and that's the best two years we've ever had. And what I want to talk about tonight, I really focus on is, it's the infrastructure moment. We have four more years of this. There's a five-year build a bipartisan infrastructure law. So we really we've got to take advantage, make the most of this moment together. And that's why we started an initiative I'll talk about that later. But So we've got some great momentum, and I know you have really excellent momentum here in Charlotte, too. But I want to chin up that, that friendly competition between the Triangle of North Carolina and Charlotte. <laughs> because they've got some good greenways up there. And Wake County's investing a lot. They've got bonds in Wake County that are funding more greenways. So I want to see the fruit of this great competition between two wonderful metropolitan areas.
building out the greenway. We've got 62 million people that live within 25 miles of East Coast Greenway. It's a lot of people to help them live a more sustainable and healthy lifestyle. Um, and uh, part of what we do, again, is on the federal level. These raise grants, the due date's February 28th, so you've got a week. <laughs> working on that for the next round. But there are so many opportunities, and that's why we're starting an initiative called Greenways for All to try to help everyone navigate the multitude of opportunity right now. Um, right here in North Carolina, we just became a state trip. It was part of the state park system, the East Coast Greenway. And there are a lot of amazing state trails now. This is really special. There's a complete trails fund that's new that we now have $5 million from, from the state, state parks, to help build out more of the East Coast Greenway. So I do encourage you to think about, is the state trail right for me, or something like that here in Charlotte? Can that help me with the momentum that I'm working with? Um, and we do have a lot of miles we're working on. I'll show you a map of it. 23 counties, 23 counties in central and eastern North Carolina that we're connecting. A lot of the major cities uh, in this route, so wonderful places. Now I'm going to give you an idea. If it's in blue, it's road. If it's green, it's off-road. So we, again, trying to look at that. 75 miles and 97% of it is off-road greenway. So I do encourage you to come up and visit that. Check it out, experience it, and then think about where are the 75 miles that I'm going to help Brett and everybody else in this room get done right here in the Charlotte region. And then, you know, maybe a lot more than that. But you see we have these hot spots, green, area, we have green areas and Wellington and Fayetteville, uh, and a lot of good places. Now, I hope, I hope you know this, but if you don't know it, this is the year of the trip. And we have a great trail state coalition that's been working on this. The governor and the legislature have said this is the year of the trail, so now is really our moment to get in front of state leadership and also to bring everybody into this movement and make it a statewide movement so everyone feels that buy-in, that they're part of making North Carolina the great trail state. So if we could check out this this nice video they put together. In North Carolina, there's a trail for each of us. An open invitation for bikers, hikers, paddlers, and riders. For amblers, explorers, and commuters. These paths are a place of refuge and recreation, connecting us to the very essence of this state. To a story winding history. And with our active use and care to its future. Because we blaze and sustain trails together, those born and bred here, and those beckoned by its promise as the great trail state. Along these trails, we lead and we follow. We march on our own and we build community. We find new purpose, generation after generation. North Carolina's trails are for all of us to enjoy, to sustain, and to champion. This is our year. The year of the trail. Nice. Mm, absolutely. Those are some sanctuaries of sanity. Those are some miles of smiles that you ever saw. My goodness. I mean, this really is a key moment for us, and it's, it's really exciting to see that, to feel the momentum in our state. I wanted to again say, share the stories of your Greenway, like Shan Riggs, who not only did he become the first person to ever run the whole East Coast Greenway and get uh, a wonderful marriage out of this amazing experience, but he raised nearly $20,000 for the nonprofit, which is an important part of the process. Give that healthy nonprofit and give that media reach so more people know about it. Because this is not something to hide, this is something we want everyone to feel welcome and included and excited. And so, if you want to reach out, you want to get to know more about East Coast Greenway, please check out map.greenway.org because then you can see where is it complete, 
where are the problem areas that I want to avoid, you know, as you think about your experience on the Greenway. And uh, always welcome you to become a member, or donor, uh, partner in, in this great work at greenway.org. There's our social media, um, all sorts of different tweet opportunities and even TikTok. Um, and then Greenways for All is our effort now, our new initiative that is set up to say, okay, we've been pretty good at this, $2 billion in the past few decades. How do we help everybody take advantage of this infrastructure moment? Because that money could go to highway expansion. All $500 billion of it pretty much could go to that. It's up to us to make sure as much as possible goes to building out greenways, conserving land, connecting people to nature and to each other. So that's the work that we can do together right here in the Charlotte region and all over the country. So I really welcome your partnership in that. I look forward to working with you and, uh, and these esteemed panelists. And uh, I think we have one more video, perhaps, uh, that sort of tries to lift up that dichotomy and that opportunity that we have.
something to be really proud of for our community to have such a great asset here. And um, so I think we can kick ass to, to Raleigh and Durham. We can do that. <laughs> we it. We will do it. Um, but I think that, like, how do we continue to do that more? And how do we continue to have experiences for everyone? And so thinking about having the ability to get to Greenway close to your home is really what I want to turn this over to Sean. Sean, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience as a resident in Victoria Heights and the west side. Yes, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sean. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Right. Oh, there we go. Um, my name is Sean Langley. I live in Macquarie Heights. Macquarie Heights is in um, just north of Johnson C. Smith University. Um, I attended Johnson C. Smith University as an undergraduate student a long time ago, 99 to 2003, um, and subsequently moved to Macquarie Heights in 2006. And so I've lived in Macquarie Heights for the last 17 years, and one of the things that I've always wanted to try to figure out was how can we make a Greenway connection from our neighborhood all the way to uptown. And part of the challenge has always been, well, it's our neighborhood kind of is situated um, almost parallel with, um, with I-77. And I just could not figure out, and one day I went, um, I was just exploring, it was winter so the foliage wasn't out and I actually noticed there was a culvert underneath of, of um, I-77. And I was like, that's it, that, that's, that's our connection. And so for the longest time, um, I've been trying to rally my neighbors, not only in McCrory Heights, but in Middle Heights, but in Oaklawn Park, Lincoln Heights, to figure out a way in which we can kind of build a coalition of folks that are interested in um, and connecting to Uptown. So, um, by way of if, when, if and when this Greenway is done, um, we would have easy accessibility to Uptown. But because of um, the highways that were constructed, um, it, it, it broke it off so that it wasn't an easy path to be able to do it. I'm an active person. I'm not doing 3,000 miles yet, but I'm a, <laughs> I'm a very active runner. Um, also love to cycle. I love to rollerblade, um, and my entire family is like that. So I have two kids, a um, wife and two kids. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And part of connecting um, to this Greenway would allow me to essentially, my daughter's in first grade, would allow her to essentially be able to take the Greenway um, behind Johnson C. Smith's softball field, behind Johnson C. Smith's football stadium underneath of 77 and it would pop out near Ray's Flash Planet right that Ray's Flash Planet is connected to her school Irwin Academic Center um, and this is also to say that McCrory Heights is one of the most this is my own biased opinion because I'm a neighbor president but is <laughs> one of the most iconic neighborhoods in all of America some of the people that lived in Macquarie Heights were responsible for, were the catalyst behind portions of the Civil Rights Movement. And it's, it's not widely known sort of Charlotte history, but I want to be able to connect people, not only the people in my neighborhood, but connect people that are traveling uptown to be able to come to this neighborhood and then kind of do like a story walk where they actually get to see the homes of where some of these pivotal people um, once lived. But the other thing I want to be able to do is allow kids in the neighborhood, allow us to do a bike bus, right? We could be able to take a bike bus directly to school, and I've seen it in other countries and other parts of this country, um, to be able to do that. So that's something that's um, very near and dear to my heart. Thankfully, the county is stepping on board, Katie Lloyd, Bert Lynn, um, we're now in, a, in the study uh, area process, and we're going to be taking a, um, a walk very soon to see how we can actually make this happen. So, thank you. Thanks, Sean. I, I think when we talk about experiences, I think there is so much history in Mecklenburg County that can be told on greenways. There's so many things that we don't know that we, we could be proud about. 
if we were connected in green ways and actually were telling the stories. Um, and I know, Sean, when I talked to you at one time, um, we had talked about that there's an own road connection possibly on Fifth Street. And, and if you just want to talk about that, having a family and biking on that, that's right. green so, ways are different, right? Right. So um, if you try to greenway on, if you try to, if you try to travel by bike um, along Fifth Street, it's just not safe. Um, the cars, even with a designated um, bike lane, even the way it's situated now, it's just not safe. Um, cars generally are going 40, 50 miles per hour. Um, and it actually probably, in my case, it's kind of given my daughter a little bit of anxiety. Um, this is as recent as of Saturday um, when we went across. Because what I do is, I, I we live so close to uptown, we're essentially the distance between where we are now and uptown. I say, we're not hopping in a car. Unless it's raining, pouring down raining, and even still, my kids would tell you that we're still going to get on our bikes, we're going to get on our rollerblades, and we're going we're to go. But it's just not physically safe right now for us to take it, which is another... This creates a, another vein for us to safely be able to communicate. Not, I'm not just speaking for my family. I'm speaking for a lot of people. I'm speaking for seniors. I'm speaking for people who have chronic diseases that are getting out and exercising. This would be so close for them to be able to, to utilize this. And not only this, th this greenway would also connect to Johnson C. Smith. So Johnson C. Smith students could then connect to the greenway. So now you're connecting not only neighborhoods, you're connecting institutions in a safe um, and convenient manner. Thanks. So I think that next we're going to hear from Katie Lloyd. And I think that's like one of the things I was saying earlier about Little Sugar Creek Greenway, we were talking about that 20 years ago as a recreational amenity. And now I think we're all talking about greenways really as public infrastructure and everyone should have equity and access. And so I think it would be really good to hear, Katie, if you're going to, you have a presentation that you're going to share. A really short presentation, but also, you know, I don't, and maybe it's in your presentation, but just the Meg playbook and how you're addressing the equity issues. I'll try to hit all that. Can you guys hear me? It's definitely worked. Okay, I can hear myself now. Uh, I promise this is very brief, but I just want to give you a little snapshot of where we are with our current agreement to development. Um, we talked about the East Coast Greenway, what, being 30 years. Um, you guys got a lot of miles now in 30 years. Um, but our first reference to a Greenway network was in 1966 in a, in a master plan created for the county. Um, and then it wasn't until 1980 that we had a Greenway master plan for Mecklenburg County. So we've been working on this for, you know, depending on which one of those dates you, um, you pick, a, a few more decades than the East Coast Greenway. Um, and today, you know, we have 63 miles of trail that is built and open to the public. There's a little bit more built right now, which I'll talk about in a minute, and that should open this year. In addition to that, there's about 17 miles of access trails that feed into that main spine of, of Greenway trails. Today, um, I'm assuming you all are Greenway fans, um, we have more, more projects and more miles currently funded and currently in construction than ever before. Um, while it took us decades and decades to get to the 63 miles, with the current funded projects and projects that are designed, we hope to get well over 100 miles um, in the next you know, five to six years. So there's definitely a ton of momentum and there's been a ton of increase in investment to this network. Um, so just on the screen, you can kind of see, you know, we're Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation. We are focused on building trails all across uh, Mecklenburg County and all the towns. Um, in the city as well. So we work on projects all over. Um, you may not even be familiar with some of these networks. Some of them are really smaller, couple miles that serve the local neighborhoods. But as Beth mentioned, you know, once we get to that four or five mile link, like Little Sugar Creek, Mallory and Toby Systems, Upper University, and then the McMullen Four Mile, we really start to see a transition from just recreational usage to um, the commuters and the people using it for their daily transportation. So go ahead to the next slide. So just to give you a little snapshot, these are a few recently completed projects in the last few years. Um, there's sections that have been built by the city of Charlotte um, through our partnership on Cross Charlotte Trail, but also projects built by the town of Cornelius and other um, 
municipal partners. So we have sections of Little Sugar Creek Greenway, Crush Road Trail up on the top, um, McDowell, which is a new connection to Torrance Creek Greenway on the bottom left, Walker Branch down in Steel Creek. Um, this was a, a, a small half mile project that was actually very important for connecting a lot of neighborhoods into an existing trail system. And then Barton Creek and University area. Next slide, please. So I mentioned we have more construction than ever before. This is the list of our current projects that um, have been bid. Um, you might not see active dirt moving quite yet on some of these, but these are all projects that are in construction for us right now. 15.2 miles. Um, of these, a little, I think, uh, right on 8.7, we hope to open this fiscal year. So hopefully by this summer, we'll, we'll finish about five of these projects, um, which is huge and very exciting for us um, as county staff who have been working on these projects for many, many years. Um, a couple highlights here. Um, close by, the closest by are the two sections of Stewart Creek and Stewart Creek Trent. Um, for those of you that have ever been to State Street and Blue Blaze Brewery, this is an extension of Stewart Creek uh, Greenway up into the Lakewood community. Also, we have two sections of Long Creek Greenway currently in construction up in the North Lake area. And then um, another kind of exciting one is towards Trip 2. Um, Sean mentioned the crossing of I-77 being a really substantial barrier. This project is pretty interesting. When 77 was under construction in northern Mecklenburg County, um, we partnered with NCDOT to have a tunnel constructed um, under, the, under the 77 highway. And so that's been sitting there for a couple of years. Uh, waiting for us to build this project that will connect it over to the Cats Park and Ride and then west to um, Rosewood Meadow and a new nature park. If anyone's ever been there, it's really cool. Go check it out. Um, so next slide. We also have these additional 13 miles, which these are projects that are nearing the um, final um, final um, design and permitting phases, and we hope to bid these projects this year, this calendar year. So potentially another 13 miles of trail starting construction sometime um, this calendar year. Next slide. So this is my contact information if you ever need me. That's my mobile. Um, I definitely prefer texting, but I'll answer your call probably. Um, and then if you ever, we have the fantastic parkandrec.com uh, website, which is pretty easy to remember, and you can find most things from there. Um, and then we also have a public input site, uh, which is publicinput.com uh, slash mechparkrec, if you want to learn about any of these active design and construction projects. I don't think I answered your equity question earlier, but um, a lot of how we um, select projects and as we're moving forward, we recently completed a new comprehensive master plan that was approved in 2021. And so some of the, the key themes that we are looking for to move forward with how we select projects and fund projects, but also how we as staff make decisions, um, are themes of committing to equity, moving beyond boundaries, telling more stories, which is huge for us. We need additional marketing staff to do that, but we want to tell more stories. Um, and so these are all things that we're trying to do to not only to take advantage of what we're already doing that we just don't tell people about, quite well enough, but also that we can move forward and we can serve um, the people of Mecklenburg County better and make better decisions for the people that use our facilities. Very good. Yes. <laughs> we have a follow-up to steal anyone's thunder or transition. Um, our elected officials have been making decisions, discretionary decisions, to invest in equity projects, which mostly means reinvesting in existing parks and some greenways that the upkeep that's been deferred. Um, the elected officials at the county level have been making some great decisions to allocate funds over time on a year-by-year -year discretionary basis. The current CIP, so the next five years of capital investment, rolls all the equity reinvestments into the CIP. The initial pass submission had $120 million of equity reinvestment. Right now, the current vision of the CIP is down to about $45 million. So um, you know, we've been investing using ARPA funds, using opportunistic approaches. I love the idea of putting it into the CIP, but at the same time, $44 million over five years, you can do some math, and it, it's basically keeping us level at where we are right now with equity reinvestment. We'd love to see that number go up. Because here are we leading? Raleigh. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that, he has got tons of information, tons of detail about the funding that 
um, it takes a while to digest, but I think it's really important to understand that. Katie, I want to get back to one thing that you were talking about. You have a bridge under 277 or 77, and you're, you're waiting. So can you talk about the waiting part? How long does it take from a line to be drawn on a piece of paper before we can actually bike or walk on the greenway? And why does that explain that time round line? That's a great question. Uh, some of those lines have been on the map since the 70s and 80s, uh, so sometimes decades. But um, from the point in time that we have a funded project and we know that we can fund the design and construction of that, absolute best case scenario for us is a minimum of three years. Um, and that gives us time to select it. We have to do an RFP process, select a consultant. We have to then do the preliminary design and community engagement phase. Then we get into a design and permitting about another year, and then the lowest is probably about the 12-month construction period. So if everything goes exactly how it's supposed to, and it's a project that only would take 12 months of construction, three years, absolute minimum. I can't think of a project that has ever taken three years from the time we started it, unfortunately. Um, oftentimes, what we're up against is um, real estate acquisition. Um, while we have been acquiring a lot of land for these projects, it could just take one project, one property owner somewhere in the middle or at any point in the project scope and that, that would potentially impact or slow down when we could start the project. Um, so that's something that we are actively working on on many, many greenway corners right now. Um, another thing is barriers, like I-77. Um, all that just takes coordination. Even if we're using existing bridge or existing culvert, that's just extra coordination time and time to get approval um, on any of our designs. If it happens to be a rail crossing, um, you can add a few more years to that. Um, because you kind of have to get, you, you know, you're shaking here. Uh, you have to get to a point in design before they will even look at your plans. And so that is, you're not starting that clock until maybe 18 months into the funded project. Um, and I'm trying to think of some other things. Any kind of permitting or any kind of um, environmental impact also just takes time. And we're definitely seeing extended review periods on any kind of um, flood permitting, any kind of um, state and roadway reviews just because there's a lot of projects happening right now and there's only so much staff that can do the work at any given time. That's really helpful. <laughs> I have a question. What are your top two sources of delay? Ooh, uh, top two sources of delay. Okay, um, I would say probably real estate is definitely probably number one. The other, I'll just say vaguely coordination, because it may be coordination on, say, we might need to wait until a roadway project is done or before we can really actually start. Or there's been cases where we've started design on a project and then we've had to shelve it for a couple of years to wait on another project to get funded and catch up. Um, we do we build a lot of projects in partnership with Charlotte Mecklenburg Stormwater Services stream restoration projects. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that along Little Sugar or Long Creek. Um, it's a great way to um, extend county dollars by building them together because we can use the same haul road, the same grading contractor. You're only mobilizing once for two projects. There's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also a lot of extra coordination on the upfront design side and during construction. It often extends our construction period as well. Honestly, quick, uh, on the land acquisition real estate front, our elected officials authorized $50 million for land acquisition for parks and greenways this year, which is, versus two years ago, a thousand percent increase. So they're, they're funding the activity, and we're trying to work with uh, the county leadership to make sure that we can execute and spend that money, and we're working with some of our local land conservancies to do some of the preliminary work, specifically with greenway landowners, to make sure that that Acquisition is a, is a big item in terms of time and cost. And so thinking about cost, um, so we have some funding in CIP that we, we recognize is probably we'd like to have more. We want to get more green waste faster. So can you and Brad, can you chime in on this also? Just about different funding sources and what those partnerships might look like. Um, what, what are some successes and what are some challenges of getting like federal and state funding? Yeah, I'll start if that's all right. Jim. So yeah, most of our current Green projects are funded through county revenue tax dollars. Um, we do have some projects that are funded through um, NCDOT or federal grants. Um, and those projects, we can get millions of dollars and usually 
Houston about the construction of those projects. We can get funded through grants if we're awarded. Um, that does typically add a good bit of time um, and cost to the project. So whereas, you know, we, when we're building them with just county dollars, we may only need county staff and a little bit of construction oversight on those um, state and federally funded projects. We have to pay for a lot more construction observation. There's a lot more testing and stuff that you have to do to build it to those standards. Um, but overall, you know, we are getting so much money for these projects that 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 um, the benefit outweighs any additional cost or um, effort that it takes for staff to build those projects. Um, in the past, there have been bonds that um, have funded some park and recreation projects, and I think um, other municipalities have used bonds or, or, or some city has used bonds before to fund Greenway Trail construction. Um, we also get some funding or some partnerships through the towns. Um, some towns contribute to our projects. Um, in some cases, though rarely, we also have developers that contribute money to some of our projects as well. Yeah, I would just speak from the from the nonprofit side of the Carolina Thread Trail. We actually have, you know, being being the type of organization we are, we get lots lots of money uh, donated to us to, to run our organization, and to also the bulk of that gets used for um, little catalytic uh, grants that we provide to our communities. We're, you know, the Carolina Thread Trail is a vision for 15 counties around Charlotte, and you know we can't afford to put out millions and millions of dollars but we have seed money that we provide we call trail implementation grants you know a hundred thousand here fifty thousand there knowing that we have different types of trails in the region some just natural surface trails that money can be very impactful and and it can be the difference between a you know a county or a city council that uh deciding whether or not to provide their own money so it's seed money it's catalytic money so you know, we like to think that our, our little grant program that we have um, has created a lot of success over the years. I think over the course of, from our inception of the Thread Trail in 2007, we've been able to give about $8 million uh, in awards. And if you know the cost of a paved greenway, you might think, well, that's not a whole lot of money. But again, it goes towards various types of trail projects, um, some natural surface, some that aren't built to this top shelf standard, but nevertheless the facility can be used. But that's leveraged over $40 million in other public sources over the years. So we kind of hang our hat on the Thread Trail being able to uh, really kind of be a spark plug to help communities get their trail on the ground. So, um, so that's what we do. I would just speaking to Katie's point, a lot of the funding that comes through uh, the, from the federal level, the funds through the state, you know, that can basically put about, on average, a 30% cost increase to a project because all the hoops you have to jump through. So there's some challenges there. Um, sometimes people have said, well, be careful what you wish for and get some of these federal grants to help build trails because they end up costing a lot of money because the different things you have, a lot of red tape you have to go through. But um, the other thing that I would say about um, uh, kind of heightening success of getting grants is municipal coordination. I mean, a lot of what we do at the Thread Trail is to uh, get communities working together over in Gaston County along the South Fork River. You have towns like McGadden, Lowell, um, Cranberton, Belmont, Mount Holly. All of them work together, and that really goes a long way towards uh, having success in a grant program because it shows that this project or this vision is just not in a vacuum and, and just lies with one community. They're all working together and they recognize the benefit. So coordination and having um, uh, joint agreements and working together make, makes, makes a huge difference. But that's a few things I'd say. So just to reiterate that you're saying that a federal or state grant might be 30% makes the Greenway 38% more expensive. Do you also have a number on the timeline it might increase? I, I would guess. I mean, I would guess Much longer. <laughs> longer, yes. Um, maybe a year, I'm not sure. Um, definitely longer in the permitting and, and approval space. Um, definitely in all the contracts because they're reviewing your contracts, which might double. Like, well, we might be able to like approve and review a contract in a couple months. It might be five to six months with an instigated project, and then the construction might be a little bit longer because you have different testing and permitting or different testing requirements, um, or approval requirements. 
So I think that one of, go ahead. Do you have dedicated people in procurement and legal for your projects? Um, dedicated, we do have staff. We have people on staff, uh, county attorney and, and, and people under the county attorney um, that work on our projects. I don't know if they're, I wouldn't say they are dedicated just to parking recreations projects, but they are dedicated to county projects. about this discussion and about this coalition of us all coming together is wanting to be open-minded and help think through like different processes. How can we help Mecklenburg County? How can we help our communities to um, be successful in building greenways faster and quicker? And so with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to Hunt. Um, and I think there, there, there's lots of different ideas out there and this is one idea to, to talk about is, um, and, and maybe just before you start Hunt, um, Katie, maybe just talk about your typical process of how you would go about getting a greenway built, and then Hunt can turn over to Hunt. He can talk about some of the other ideas. Yeah. So we um, build pretty much all of our greenway projects is design, bid, build. So we design it. We get all of the permits. We get all the land squared away. We bid it to qualified contractors, qualified, be awarded there. Um, they have to be able to do the work. And then we select the lowest bidder um, of those qualified um, people that bid on our projects. And then they build it. Um, we have a couple contractors in the room who so are pretty familiar with that project process, I believe. Um, for the most part, that is the only way I know that we have built greenways in Mecklenburg County. Um, there are other ways to build projects, and in other ways that we have built other types of projects, um, which I think has to go into. Yeah, thanks. Um, so far. Beth and I have discussed before is just the interest of the group is how do we build greenways faster? How do we get things done quicker? Some of the things we're facing these days is just shortage of labor. That's in Beth's group, that's in my company, that's in everyone's company. If somehow we have to do a team together to build a team that goes and tackles these projects. So throughout the Carolinas, what we've seen a big uh, push for is more of seem at risk, which is bringing the architect and the general contractor on early um, and in the process to help through the whole design, pricing, and getting the bid process. Also, design build has become a lot more prevalent because it really helps uh, alleviate some of the county's time and the city's time to help manage on the general contractor and create that team. So that we're able to do more things with everyone's time. So it really speeds up that process and we see um, about a 30 to 40% increase in time from start to finish. So that, that helps a lot. I think there is some concern a lot about um, costs associated with that. So some of the time side of things that helps is um, we're given a budget. There, there's a allocated money to a greenway. And a lot of times when we design it and we go bid it, it's over budget. So when you bring someone on early, that cost certainty is developed over time, and that really helps speed up the process. Um, and when you look at the bidding process, we still go out to all the contractors throughout the community, and we have a lot of outreach that drives that cost down and also drives the coordination down. So you mentioned before, and uh, we before about coordination when you can think through the project and drive the amount of issues down it speeds up the project and well the initial cost might be a little larger uh, than a um, hard bid those costs creep up on them and they have to pay for hard bid so it really saves time and money then. and then uh, we're, so we're seeing a lot more of this and then also there is a concerted effort to try to bring community involvement in there. Um, so as a general contractor is on the board, you want to see more local contractors get involved, some more MWPE participation. So there's a lot of outreach happens, and that also can affect fundraising. Um, fundraising we outside and the thread trail is important to help with the funds and get public-private partnerships that are a lot more prevalent in the, in the larger CM at risk 
but size doesn't really matter. We have two design build parks underway that are a um, million dollars. So it's not that the size of the project uh, matters, but we can kind of go all sizes. We'll see this a lot more in um, the Raleigh Durham area. Any questions? So I know mean, we're short on time, so I just wanted to check real quick with Meg. We're good. The only thing I want to show again is the slide of all the workshops. Okay. Okay. Great. So I think that that's, that's really interesting. I think there's a lot of questions. So I'm just going to pause and take questions right now. Um, Paul, what did I say? I just want to say on the public advocacy front, we've got momentum now. Katie talked about how many miles of greenway we're, we have in process and will be completing. I think that goes to the learning curve and the ability of us to keep that going of our work with developers. Their ability to hire and staff talent is we have to keep the momentum for them to be able to commit to projects and maintain that knowledge base to keep things going forward at that specific pace. It's really important. Two numbers I'd ask you to take away. We got to acquire 400 acres per year to meet our minimum goals for land acquisition and informally. Building Greenway 
counties and cities versus rural. I mean, obviously, there's quite a different dynamic. But when you see massive buildouts all throughout Charlotte, you know the Greenway right next to the construction projects is going to enhance that value. And you know it's going to enhance the quality of life for everybody who's a part of that whole thing. I find, uh, I find that here in Charlotte, we're, we're definitely resource constrained in a very, very big way, which means that we don't have like a person who is a way of life, or somebody who goes out and actively cultivates private public partnerships. That's not what we don't have that. We don't have the luxury of that. We don't have um, uh, well, that whole spirit is just kind of it's, it's not quite there. The question for for everybody on there, with perhaps the institution of Katie who's heard her talk about this way too much, is like how do we how do we change that? Because Everything I'm hearing is the word we're relying on grants and lessons from politicians who are, you know, are just worried about that next election. And you know, it's like there, we should tie, for me, I feel like we should, there's got to be a way to tie the ability to have these amazing resources for the community for the people who are profiting the most from it. Um, and we can then help them profit even more by, by getting, you know, you know, by, by laying it up. I'm just looking for, for advice and just in perspective of that. Well, I'll, I'll ask. You guys, there you are. I can just tell you from our perspective, if the, the thread trail is sort of our scale and us kind of cultivating those um, relationships with private industry is, um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a governing board that's very well connected in the business and industry community. And, you know, couple that with the fact that, you know, thankfully the Carolina Thread Trail is a regional vision is growing uh, in awareness. And that includes cities and towns recognizing it, our partners, and also the development community. So, um, you know, we have board members who talk to their friends in the business community and, you know, uh, talk about the importance of this vision, they go out and sell it, and again, you know, those billions of dollars that we've been able to um, help out with trails um, comes completely from the private industry. So I don't know if there's a magic formula for it, at least from my standpoint, but certainly the private community is gaining more and more knowledge of the importance of a regional trail system. So I have developers coming to me a lot. Again, I have our board members who go out there and talk to their friends to raise money. Uh, for us to help with our uh, catalytic funding. Um, you know, the good thing about the Thread Trail and the partnerships we've cultivated, cultivated is, you know, I'm fortunate that I, I know lots of business and industry leaders, I know lots of developers who I can just get on the phone with and talk to about our, about our vision and our project, and so I'm a pretty good resource for uh, contacts out there in the private development community, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try to put anybody in touch with, you know, with a uh, company or organization that might uh, be involved in these, um, these trail projects. But, I mean, our life, our lifeblood is, is private funding, so we, have, we, we rely solely on that. So let's give a little more, Brett. Let's send a little more over to Brett and the team uh, he's working with, of course, Sustain Charlotte and Partnership with Parks as well. But, um, and from the East Coast Greenway's perspective, we've worked with a number of cities. So I'd say, how do we increase it? Um, could be looking at models. Where has it worked well? Like you say, maybe New York City, looking at that model. In Philadelphia, uh, is a model, the William Penn Foundation. And they have actually put over $100 million into helping to develop trails along the waterways to connect people to the Delaware River watershed. It's a great model. I would say, and it's built out a lot of the East Coast Greenway. It's transformed the city. The Schuylkill River used to be this place where people dump their stuff and they turn their back on it. And now it's the center of the city where everybody wants to be and run and walk and bike and all of that. I think the case study in successful private public partnerships is probably the Atlanta Beltline. Yes, that's, yeah, that's I, another great um, You know, it has, there's challenges that go along with that, but that usually rises to the top of the list of you know, the, the success of public-private partnerships, that's what I think of. Yeah, so, I mean, we've got to get a greenway that connects Johnson C. Smith University. Yeah. We've got to get, you know, certain projects, we need to get those 
philanthropic dollars that helped you grease the skids on. Just to date myself real fast, I was down on your campus in 2002, 2003. So I was already out of college at that point. Um, and I worked with Common Cause. We were uh, uh, Congressman G.K. Butterfield and some other folks there. And, um, you know, I just love the fact that we've got to connect those institutions, those core institutions, and make sure that everybody understands the rich history of all those institutions. So this is a critical part of the Race for All. Uh, we've got to bring it to every community. Um, and, and just back to your point, um, I think our what we would like to do is we are going to have another session where we do talk about the development community, so not just philanthropic, but how, what are some of the tools that we can learn from other communities that we can apply to Mecklenburg County and the city of Charlotte. So stay tuned for another session on that. Uh, there's one more question that Meg is going to kick me off here. So. Yeah. Um, talk about the green waste wall, and I wonder if anyone on the panel or the development community to talk about equity and the contracting, the building of these uh, green waste, as far as it relates to business development, economic development, you know, of uh, uh, small business, and specifically after the <coughs> I'll start and then I'll let other people jump in. So yes, for each of our um, county bid projects, we have tar goals and targets um, for equity and for diversity in our contracting pool. Um, we've recently implemented a new system, whereas we used to have a standard percentage across all projects and all project types. We now um, meet with our BDI group internally, which that's um, their staff review all of our projects. And we set specific targeted goals for each project based on the types of trades in the engineer's estimate on those projects. So really thinking about um, what is our contractor pool within Mecklenburg County and based on the different types of work that they do and what are realistic and um, uh, good goals to have for each of those contracting types within a certain project. Um, so we've done a lot of work within the county to also build up um, our different contractor pools. We actually have an event tomorrow that is a networking event about parking rec greenway projects and stream restoration and, and stormwater projects um, to be kind of part uh, networking so you know it's our smaller uh, subcontractors can meet with the larger more established contractors in some of these jobs but also as an educational piece to learn about county process um, to meet with some of the staff that, that work in that area and also to learn about upcoming projects that are coming out to bid. I know we work uh, very on the sewer risk projects. It helps drive up the percentage of uh, HUB and MWBE participation. Just, just just because we're able to do a lot more outreach, we're get allowed to get people uh, qualified and also help people. So we have a group uh, that just helps pre-qualification and also think about where uh, a small business might be able to work on the project and team people together. Maybe you have the labor in your business but don't have the expertise, and someone else has the expertise but not the labor, and we're, we're able to kind of marry the two together and think about a uh, like a joint venture for smaller contractors to continue to grow and, uh, and increase that participation in projects. I'd like to add to that the importance of the engagement, the community engagement from the get-go. Uh, a lot of us have these grand visions, but we you know, this is not a cookie cutter project when we talk about East Coast Greenway, we talk about the Carolina Thread Trail. It's really important to connect with the neighborhoods, with the communities, and get that buy in and, you know, make sure that we're listening in terms of what is it that that community wants in their corridor. Um, so that's a really good part of, the, part of the work. And actually, there's a lot of resources that we have at greenwaysforall.org including an inclusionary trail planning tool toolkit that we worked with the Pennsylvania Environmental Council on. And uh, it has a lot of important tips on that engagement. Because as we talk about the speed with which we get these greenways done, there's a term you may have heard, things can only go at the speed of trust. You know, you really have to develop that, that community buy-in so that the project can move forward. Otherwise, you know, why should it move forward, but also it will slow down, necessarily. So just the importance of that starting from the beginning as you're developing that vision, 
really connecting with the communities, the institutions, the neighborhoods, and then building from there. And then also, you know, the integration of how do we bring in all the best contractors and, and have that equity piece on that side of things as well. All right, with that, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for your time, for your passion, and for caring about making our communities better. Just all give the panelists. Thank you so much for coming.